Amen. Thank you, Liz. And appreciate all those that minister in music on the platform. Amen. Thank God for you. John's Gospel, Chapter 2. We're going to go there in the Word of God. Gospel of John, Capitulo 2. There was a father that was trying to motivate his son uh, to <clears throat> study and be hard and diligent as a student. And he brought up the subject of Abraham Lincoln. And he said to his boy, do you know what Abraham Lincoln was doing? Do you know what Abraham Lincoln was doing when he was your age? And the son says, no, I don't. But I know what he was doing when he was your age. Not a lot of laughter on that one right there. <clears throat> Nobody is a success overnight. At least none that I'm aware of. Success in life is a result of good uh, choices and good habits in your life that are practiced over a long period of time. Someone said these words. We all deal with setbacks, but in the long run, the quality of our lives depends on the quality of our habits. With the same habits, you will end up with the same results. But with better habits... Anything is possible. You may be here this morning or you may be in line with us this morning and think that there is no hope for you to improve your life. That may be uh, what's hanging over your head <clears throat> because many people fall into that category. I spoke with some people yesterday and I could tell that you know, they responded in different ways to, to the gospel, to a witness. But oftentimes... It's because they don't think their life can get any better. And so they're completely writing off any avenues, you know, even if you're talking to them about God. So people fall into that and they settle. They settle for being disconnected and without hope. I know a man that smoked pot for 50 years. And he also admitted that he was extremely immature in many areas and arenas of life. However, today he's a believer in Jesus Christ and has been free from drugs, uh, marijuana, alcohol, and even cigarettes for over three years. He attends, he attends some um, uh, marijuana anonymous meetings, and he shocks everyone when he says, yeah, I've been, how long have you been? Uh, about 50 years. <laughs> and now he knows that his walk with God requires effort. It requires daily habits. So I want to consider uh, the life of Jesus while he was here on earth, specifically his earth, earthly ministry. And the thing about the Bible is you can read the Lord's life or about his life. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are all four Gospels that basically are uh, portraits of Christ. They all talk about his earthly ministry. And we can apply his life, his actions, and his purpose, and his spirit to ours. And so I want to look at one particular arena that... <clears throat> Jesus demonstrates something to us. And so let's look in John 2, starting at verse 13, reading through verse 22. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. <clears throat> when he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the money change, uh, the changers' money um, and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then the disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. So the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show us since you do these things? And Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he has, uh, had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Let's pray. Father, we ask this morning <clears throat> through your word that you would speak to every heart in this place, every person online. Let your purposes, God, be made clear. Give us revelation that will help us to live for you and be a blessing to our families and our world. We ask your blessing, anointing, and grace to be at work this morning. 
And we ask it in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. So many people scratch their head on this text. Because here's God in the flesh getting upset. And uh, I think there's a couple things we can pull from this. I'm not asking you to, to, to pull out a whip this morning. But some things do not belong in your life. Jesus said, destroy this sanctuary, and he was talking about his body. Jesus did some serious house cleaning right here. Not because they were doing what they were doing was evil. <clears throat> These were legitimate businesses. The things that they were doing, the money changers, you know, I don't know how many of you go to dove sellers, but these are all legitimate businesses, but not in the God's house. People come to church to touch God. It's a house of prayer, and Jesus said it's a house of prayer for what? For all nations. Mark chapter 11, verse 17, <coughs> it says, after Jesus did this, he began to teach them, saying, it is written, is it not? My house should be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have turned it into a hideout for revolutionaries. So people can make church into all kinds of things that it was never meant to be. And you can tell that this is happening when people stop praying at church. It's become something else. Now, we don't crack the whip here this morning and say, you must pray. Hey, you're not praying. <clears throat> but Jesus cracked the whip and said, this must, must be removed. I want you to know this morning that prayer is God's idea. Prayer is God's idea. It's not our idea. Some previous civilization didn't come up with this idea. It's God's idea. Jesus taught about prayer often, and he practiced prayer. The disciples finally caught on, and they said, Lord, teach us to pray. <laughs> teach us. And that is where the Lord's prayer came from. Teach us to plug in to God through prayer. Have you ever been... You're at work or you're at home or you're at church or, you know, before you go to bed and your phone, you know, your phone's at 2% power. And even though, you know, you're next to a charger, you forget to plug it in and your phone dies and your life is over. <laughs> My phone's dead. My life has come to an end. But prayer... Is you plugging into God? Don't come and not pray. Don't come and not touch God. Getting power, getting wisdom, getting provision, getting forgiveness. And we often tell people, we are reaching, <clears throat> you've got to plug into a church. Why? Because the church helps you plug into God. So we. Uh, with Jesus here cleansing the temple, which is a very serious event, I think it's safe to say that we need to remove whatever hinders us from what the church, partially what the church is for, and that is for prayer. Prayer in your life. What prevents you from praying? What would prevent you <coughs> from praying? Is it the pillow monster? You just can't get up. I was reading a book called Atomic Habits. And this book's written by a young man who loved baseball. And he was on his way to playing at least college level. But he was injured in baseball or in high school. He had a bat. Somebody swung the bat and it went straight in between his eyes and had some major injuries. And so uh, his baseball career was put on hold, to say the least. Uh, but rather than quit, he enrolled in college anyway, and he decided to develop some good habits in his life. <clears throat> I'm going to read you an excerpt from the book. It says, I, I wasn't going to be starting on the baseball team anytime soon, so I focused on getting my life in order. 
While my peers stayed up late and played video games, I built, a good, I built good sleep habits and went to bed early each night. In the messy world of a college dorm, I made it a point to keep my room neat and tidy. These improvements were minor, but they gave me a sense of control over my life. I started to feel confident again, and this growing belief in myself rippled into the classroom as I improved my study habits and managed to even get earn straight A's during my first year. Just by small changes <coughs> and the habits in our lives, good habits in our lives. Could you clean up some areas in your life? Could you make some, perhaps, maybe it's big changes, but maybe it's just small changes. I believe conversion to Jesus Christ will make you throw some things out. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I wonder how many people get converted, and because of that, they throw some things out. I remember throwing away lots of pictures of my old sinful life. Now, I have a few for a reminder that's, my, that's not me anymore. And that was my conviction. To clean up some areas of your life. <clears throat> I didn't need Michelob, even if it was Michelob light, in my refrigerator anymore. Somebody said happiness is good health and a bad memory. <laughs> because you cannot live in the past especially after you've come to faith in Jesus Christ. You can't do it. <clears throat> Secondly, it says in our text, a zeal for your house has eaten me up. And what this is talking about, partially, it's talking about a very passionate situation in a person's life. The scripture calls it zeal. A zeal, an enthusiasm, a passion, a fire. Now, you and I, the Bible says, ought to be zealous people. We ought to be passionate people. <clears throat> of course, it matters what you are zealous for. This is a quote from Psalm 69, verse 9, and it says, Zeal for your house has eaten me up, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. Now, let me say something very quickly. One of the ways you know that you have a zeal for God is you're willing to take some reproach for him. The New Living Translation says, a passion for your house. The CEV says, my love for your house burns in me like a fire. I like that. Jesus says, my love for your house burns in me like a fire. What burns in you? What consumes you? What is it that is burning uh, on the inside? My wife and I were driving to visit my father-in-law <coughs> last Friday. It was his 88th birthday. He's 88 years old. Keep him in prayer. But while we were driving, we uh, ended up listening to a podcast on pies. <coughs> pies. The ladies that were talking about pies were passionate. Got me a little fired up. <laughs> and she said these words, if you don't like pie, it's because you've never had a good one. I said, babe, pull over right now. <laughs> Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The Amplified Bible says, for where your treasure is, there your heart, your wishes desires, and that which your life centers will be also. So Jesus <clears throat> wasn't just involved. Hmm, hey, Mom, I think I'll get involved in some teaching ministry, perhaps. I think I'll check out those young men with this discipleship program. Don't they, like, go to Redlands once a month or something? Maybe I'll involve myself in some of that. Jesus' heart burned for the house of God. Because the house of God is what connects people with God's kingdom and God's will. 
At 12 years old, Jesus ran away, didn't he? <clears throat> In a sense, he ran away. I bet you some of you here this morning have stories about when you ran away. One time I remember I ran away, but it was about seven houses down to my friend's house. But I'm sure some of you have much more serious stories. But at 12 years old, he ran away. Where did they find him when he ran away? In the temple. Let me read to you out of the ISV, Luke chapter 2, verse 41 through 49. Every year, Jesus' parents would go to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. <clears throat> when he was 12 years old, they went up to this festival as usual. And when the days of the festival were over, they left for home. The young man, Jesus, stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents didn't know it. They thought he was in the group of travelers. And after traveling for a day, a whole day, they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they didn't find him, <clears throat> they went all the way back to Jerusalem, anxiously looking for them. And three days later, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. <clears throat> all who heard him were amazed at his intelligence and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were shocked. His mother said, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been worried sick looking for you. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? The King James says, do you not know that I must be about my father's business? So our God wants his people to have passion. <coughs> he wants us to have enthusiasm, which literally means God filled. Something we have to understand when we're talking about passion is that God is passionate about you. God has a burning in his heart for you. The focus is upon his bride. The priority of the church is impossible to overstate. Jesus says, I will build my church. <coughs> it's mine. I'm passionate about my church. I'm passionate about the church is also called the bride of Christ. Because for the last 2,000 years, we are living in the church age. And his aim is to get people into the body. And we would do well if we would say, Lord, uh, I thank you <coughs> for your passion for me and the church. Uh, and I want to do, th uh, do the same for you. I want to have a passion for you. So God has a passion for people. For people. I think we would do well to have a heart for people as well. If you don't have a heart for people, ask God to give you one. Ask him to give you a passion. There's a book entitled The Passion for Souls written by Oswald Smith. One of the classics. And it's dealing with just that. Having a passion for souls. Because our business as the church is what? It's people. <clears throat> the scariest thing about any society is a cold heart towards people. Because we're all different, aren't we? We're all different. You know, there, there's uh, people that are vegans today. That's different. I actually saw a boxer who was a vegan. He went up against Lennox Lewis. He didn't win, <clears throat> but he didn't go down either. <laughs> Who knows? But the Bible says lawlessness shall abound and the hearts of many shall grow cold. Jesus was attacking the dangerous thing that the church could become. That is a place where people come only to make money. I can remember people showing up at church <coughs> trying to recruit people for their pyramid scheme. I remember one guy, we were at an outreach, and this guy shows up, and, and he's looking for one of, the, one of the guys in the church. And I thought he was coming to you know, be a part of what we're doing, but yet he's looking for someone else because he's trying to recruit him for his pyramid scheme. And it just felt strange. <clears throat> but the church, and I close with this thought, is about the reaching 
of souls and the well-being of people. Not the control of people. Throughout history, the church has at times seemed to be more interested in dominating lives rather than get them saved and plugged into Jesus. And so we cannot be here to make a name for ourselves. You know, Joe Smith's ministries or Prophet so-and-so's ministries. And they pull up in their Lamborghini. We can't be about that. <clears throat> That's not why we're here. We believe in blessing. We believe in increase in all of those things. But those are secondary. The primary thing for the church is the preaching of Jesus Christ and him crucified to all the world. To all the world. But the thought we have in our text is Jesus cleanses the temple and no doubt he wants to cleanse our lives. See, sometimes it's a radical cleansing. Think about this current building. <clears throat> Before this, we were here, this place was a dispensary. So they sold marijuana here. And next door was a smoke shop, which just was undercover for marijuana again. <clears throat> and so it's gone. It's no longer here, right? We painted over the Bart Simpson with bloodshot eyes, <laughs> smoking a blunt. Because that doesn't connect with God. Oh, Bart didn't look good in that picture. I think I saw even Colton has it in their year end video of us painting over Bart Simpson. I was like, that's classic. But we have to allow Jesus to remove things out of our lives that prevent us from doing our Heavenly Father's business. For some of us, it would be people. <clears throat> it could be activities. It could be habits. But we have to allow the Spirit of God to mark things to be removed. You have to allow the Spirit of God to come with his highlighter and say, got to go. Maybe it's, you know, nowadays people don't have music collections. They have playlists, right? <clears throat> Stuff I used to listen to did not glorify God. But allow the, the God of heaven to look at our lives and say, I want to help you. I want to help you. And God will help us. <clears throat> My wife and I, we got married back in 1989. And I remember I had this one shirt that I used to wear for years. I love that shirt. But I wore it, and I'm sure it looked dingy and old and tore up. And eventually she said, it's got to go. I still miss that shirt. But God can reach into our lives, can't he? So we gotta, we've got to do some things here. Listen to this one scripture, and we'll pray. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. If anyone is in union with Christ, he is a new creation. What was old has disappeared, and now everything, I want you to say everything, has become new. A newness to life. And I'm telling you here, it doesn't get old. A new heart, a new mind, a new attitude. For some, a new wardrobe, a new direction, and best of all, a new destiny. A new destiny for our lives. We were headed in one direction, which wasn't good. God got a hold of our lives. He says, no, 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 this is what I have for you. Don't land your plane over there. I've got a new destiny for your life, if you'll allow God to work in your life, some of you this morning, things can begin to change today. If you'll allow the Spirit of God to have access to your life. Amen. Let's bow our heads this morning. <clears throat> if we could, for just a moment, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, and we end in prayer. I want to take time to give people an opportunity to think things through this morning about your life. It's between you and God. <clears throat> it's between you and God. 
What is it the Spirit of God is speaking to you about? Every one of us have to stop and look. It's a new year. I know we're in February, but when a new year comes, everybody thinks about what, you know, the New Year's resolutions and such. But rather than us make up our minds about what we want to do, what about Jesus? If we'll be open to him speaking into our lives. He is the master. He's, he, he's the great physician. He knows things that are hurting us. He knows things that will help us. But allow him to remove some things out of your life. You don't have to continue like the world does or like others around you. You can begin to live for God and have a desire to honor him with your life, with your choices, with your habits. And ultimately, God's will will be accomplished in your life. I wonder before we close this morning, you're here this morning and perhaps your heart is not right with God. In other words, you don't know Jesus in a personal way. If you were to die today, if you were to slip into eternity today, would you make heaven your home? It's not a trick question because there's a name in heaven, a book in heaven called the Lamb's Book of Life. If your name's recorded you have a reservation in heaven. If your name's not recorded, then this morning you can get it recorded by, by a simple yet important decision to receive Christ in your life as Lord and Savior. I wonder this morning, you're here, God's speaking to you. You want to give your life to Christ. You'd be honest. You'd lift your hand. You'd lift it up and we'll pray for you. Amen. God bless you, sir. Someone else this morning. <clears throat> yes, amen. Others, you want to be honest. You want to get your heart right with God. You're not saved. You're not right with the Lord. Or maybe you once walked with the Lord, but this morning you're backslidden. You find yourself in a bad, a bad, bad spot. You've taken an off-ramp, and you find yourself in a bad neighborhood, bad company. And you want to come back to Jesus. You want to rededicate your life. You want to hit the reset button. You'd lift your hand. We'll pray for you this morning. Amen. <clears throat> Maybe you're online with us and God's speaking to your heart. You want to come clean with the Lord. Uh, you can pray this morning as well. You can ask for forgiveness of sins. Amen. And he can cleanse you. <clears throat> In just a moment, we're going to open the altar for a time of prayer. But this is a time right now where we can talk to God. We have altar calls not just to get saved. We have altar calls so, so people can come and talk to God about various things. Perhaps, perhaps there, there's some clear things that need to be taken care of. Or, or perhaps there's other things that you would open your heart, you would avail your life and say, Lord, what is it that you want to do in my life? I'm here. I'm available. I want to respond to you in the affirmative. I'm willing to do your will as you speak clearly to 